Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Avi Meyerstein. I'm a member of Hush Blackwell's Technology Manufacturing and Transportation Group. And joining me today is my partner, Amy Walks, another member of the group. Uh, thank you for joining us. We want to welcome you to our webinar this morning. We and over 20 other colleagues around the country focus our practices on helping clients successfully deal with workplace safety and health matters involving agencies like federal and state occupational safety and health administrations, uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, Chemical Safety Board, Department of Transportation, and many others. And what we do to assist our clients is everything from advice to help them comply with regulations to training for their management teams, training like this, um, leading investigations uh, when there are accidents, representing clients during inspections, um, and if citations emerge, defending citations. Um, and we also help people with participating in rulemakings to make their voices heard when new rules are being made. Amy also works on state and federal environmental rules and the hazardous materials transportation requirements that affect many companies in the United States. So we're excited to talk to you today about OSHA and how to handle an inspection. This is the kickoff webinar in our six-part series on a variety of safety and health topics. And um, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items that we wanted to talk about. Um, if you're looking at your screen, you'll see at the bottom a number of icons. And those, if you click them, will enable different tools. The question mark uh, will take you to some basic information to answer common questions you might have. There's a Q&A button, and that will turn on and off the question and answer box. So you should see a Q&A box on your screen where you can put in questions that we'll try to address. We're really excited to have you participate, and we want to encourage you to make this a two-way conversation, uh, even though we're the only ones talking by voice. Um, so please submit your questions as we go. We'll do our best to answer them along the way. If there are any questions we can't answer fully, uh, or that we run out of time to address, we'll certainly follow up with you by email. Um, there's an icon that you can use to adjust your viewing preferences. You can expand the slide area, the box that shows the slides, by using the maximize icon at the top right of that box. Um, you can also move it around the screen or drag it from the bottom right corner to make it bigger or smaller. Um, there's a resource list icon which looks like a piece of paper with some lines on it at the bottom, and your resource list may be already showing. We put a bunch of links in there to be helpful to you. One is a copy of this presentation. Right below that is a link to subscribe to our blog, Safety Law Matters, which we encourage you to do for uh, at least a couple uh, items a week of safety and health law news. Um, and uh, also some links to register for our upcoming webinar and to report CLE credits. On that note, this program has been approved by Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin for continuing legal education credit, and Kansas, Kansas credit is still pending. To report your hours in Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, Tennessee, or Texas, just click on the CLE reporting link in that resources list in that box, at, and uh, you can complete the questions there to, to fill out and get your credit. You'll need your bar numbers to submit. And we'll also send you a link after the webinar to report your hours in these states for your convenience. The program has also been approved for one hour of uh, general credit for HRCI and SHRM for all the HR folks who are on the line with us. Finally, a recording of the webcast will be available tomorrow for watching and sharing. Uh, once that's available, the link will be emailed to you along with your certificate of attendance. So with those preliminaries out of the way, uh, why don't we dig right in? To start with, we want to just set the stage by reviewing OSHA's general authority and, um, and, and what its focus is. So uh, OSHA has, between the state and federal OSHA, uh, quite a bit of territory to cover, most uh, private workplaces and some public ones, which ends up being about 8 million work sites uh, but only about 2,100 inspectors. And the takeaway from that is they have to focus on the highest priorities and, and spend a lot of effort trying to figure out where to focus their energies. Uh, these are state and federal programs. Some states have approved plans where they have actually run the OSHA program. 
but the state standards are at least as strict as the federal standards, and sometimes uh, they have additional requirements. OSHA's focus is both on safety and health, and for the most part, the requirements are put forth in regulations, detailed regulations on every conceivable subject from um, guarding dangerous equipment to wearing protective, uh, protective gear when you're working, um, training requirements and the like. But in addition, OSHA has a catch-all where uh, under the general duty clause, every employer is required to make sure that they're providing a workplace that's free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. So even if a particular regulation doesn't apply to a particular condition or situation, um, OSHA has the latitude to uh, enforce and issue citations under that general duty clause. A final general introductory note is OSHA has a six-month statute of limitations for issuing citations. So from the time that the inspection opens to the time they actually issue a citation at most is going to be six months. Let's turn for a second to what it can cost you if enforcement occurs and things go south. Uh, a lot of employers want to know what's at stake, what's on the line. And last year, actually, the penalties for OSHA violations went up. So first of all, you've got the government penalties that get issued with the citations and the violations. Um, the penalties went up to, uh, depending on the type of violation, about $12,000 per violation uh, for serious or other than serious violations. Um, they went up to $12,000 likewise for failure to abate. And then if you're in the zone of a willful or repeated violation, and we're going to talk about what these different kinds of violations are later, they can be up to $124,000 per violation. I just want to flag an important note the per violation piece of this because the record for OSHA penalties is about $81 million and that came about because hundreds of violations were all found and, pe and penalized at the maximum. So you, you add those up. That's not the maximum per inspection. That's the maximum per violation that OSHA may find. But penalties are not the only thing that uh, an, an OSHA inspection that goes awry can cost you. Abatement is a big issue for a lot of companies. If OSHA comes in and finds that one of your processes is set up in a way that they believe creates a hazard and a violation, then abatement can be very expensive. It's possible that OSHA makes an abatement demand that would cost you thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars or more uh, certainly once you start expanding it from one of your work sites to several work sites if you have a number of operations. So the abatement costs are a big deal and a big reason that companies often will contest citations to try to um, uh, resolve the abatement concerns that they have and, and at least negotiate with OSHA to find something that's more feasible. Um, if an inspection goes uh, poorly and uh, people do things that they shouldn't do, like uh, falsify documents or um, lie to in investigators and such, you always have the possibility of criminal charges. Um, criminal charges can emerge from the violations themselves, but those are pretty rare cases. Uh, the bigger concern that we often have is that something happens during the inspection where someone who's well-meaning perhaps um, does or says something improper and that that raises OSHA's criminal concerns. Civil lawsuits can be an issue. Um, it's always a concern about whether uh, enforcement by OSHA will lead to or support a third-party lawsuit uh, that you might be facing um, externally and they try to use the OSHA enforcement as evidence against you. Um, there are other costs too, sometimes more intangible like investor relations, employee relations, community relations. You have a lot of stakeholders who are connected to your business and uh, they will find out if um, you have a, a negative safety and health situation, if you have an inspection and get a lot of violations issued. Um, and that can affect how investors think. It can affect community relations. It, it affects how your employees feel and, and employee morale as well. 
And then finally, another piece that, that often comes into the cost side for, for many companies is contracts, um, especially government contractors, but sometimes private contractors as well, may have uh, business agreements that require that they maintain a certain track record when it comes to safety and health uh, legal issues. And um, I've had clients who uh, said they couldn't afford to get even a single citation of any kind or they would risk losing a major contract that they had. And so that becomes an issue as well. Um, I want to turn it over to Amy. She's going to talk a little bit about how OSHA focuses its energies and decides whom to inspect. Avi, I think you, I think uh, we lost your audio for a second, so I think it's my turn. Thanks, Avi. For, Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, OSHA inspection targets uh, what what they are looking for, uh, what they how they come at you is, and how they find you, and why they show up at your door uh, are based on several different targets. One is the first thing that they're looking for is death and serious accidents. OSHA looks at the news, they listen to the police radio, and they hear about any industrial accidents. So if a, an ambulance shows up in your front door, the police helicopter is, setting, is uh, up above your facility, OSHA will probably be there shortly. Also, we're seeing a lot more inspections recently because there, you are now required to notify OSHA if you have an inpatient hospitalization of one employee. So if you you make that uh, disclosure to OSHA, quite often they'll show up at the door. If not, at least send you an email uh, request for information. Also, employee complaints. OSHA will follow up on all credible employee complaints, sometimes just by email, but quite often they'll just show up at the door because an employee made a complaint. The more serious it sounds, the more likely they are to show up at the door. Other agencies will notify OSHA if they see something when they're in your facility that needs follow-up on a health and safety matter. Then they have uh, you know, their programmed inspections. Programmed inspections are just their normal, routine type of inspections. The way they choose people is they first look at their national emphasis program. So there are some programs net nationwide that OSHA is looking at facilities that may have things like, for example, I put down uh, combustible dust, amputations, process safety management, lead hazards. There are a number of national emphasis programs. And then every region also has uh, local emphasis programs, which could be anything. Uh, we were looking at one recently where body art was the national, one of the local emphasis programs. A lot of regions have emphasis programs on excavation and construction, so quite often they're targeting those for, for inspections. OSHA's inspection powers, OSHA is a little different than the other federal agencies that you might see coming into your facility, and that is OSHA doesn't have an automatic right to just walk in the door. They, they need a warrant or your consent. So therefore, if they show up at the door, if, if they come into your facility, they will have your, con your consent, which you can revoke at any time. Um, if you revoke your consent right at the beginning, in other words, you decide for whatever reason that you're not going to let them in, they can get a warrant. Um, they, they don't necessarily need to have the probable cause that you need for a criminal search warrant. In this case, it's an administrative inspection warrant, and they, they can show just that they have a programmatic reason to inspect your facility. So they will also get a warrant if they have a reasonable belief of a violation threatening physical harm, but they can get an administrative uh, inspection warrant just by showing that they have a neutral agency uh, inspection procedure, and, that's, and they want uh, access just for that reason. Once the inspector comes into your facility, they can cite anything in plain view. In other words, no matter what the reason why they showed up at your facility, they can cite 
anything they see. So if they if they come in because of a, of an employee complaint, they and they're just looking for one thing. If they happen to walk by an unguarded machine, they can cite you for the unguarded machine. There's nothing. Everything's fair game. Now, when it comes to whether you're going to give them in, consent to inspect or not, most people find it's best to give consult to en consent to enter but use the ability to give consent as a means to negotiate the scope of the inspection. So for example, if OSHA comes in and says, we've had an employee complaint about XYZ, you can say, okay, we'll, you have consent to enter and we'll go look at XYZ. And so you limit the inspection at that point for just what OSHA wants to see. You can also discuss with them right in the very beginning, what is it you're coming here to see? What is it you want to see? So you can limit your, the scope of the inspection just to those things that they said they wanted to see. Um, if no warrant has been obtained, you can always terminate your consent. If things get too hot, too crazy, you can just say, you know what, I think it would be better if you came back another day. Now, believe me, they will come back another day, and, you know, they can request a warrant, and generally, once they get a warrant, you know, they had to go through a lot of work to get that warrant, so they're often going to make it worth their time. So be aware that any inspection after the warrant will likely be more thorough than it would otherwise be. However, I have had lots of circumstances where people have asked for a warrant, it turned out okay, in that uh, they had one large thing that they wanted to fix, and they could fix it quickly. So they turned OSHA away, they went and fixed it, and by the time OSHA came back, it was fixed. Um, and, you know, so, you know, one, one other thing that I found that there are some people I know that always ask for a warrant, and OSHA knows that after the first couple of times, and they'll get a warrant before they even show up, and then there's absolutely, once they have a warrant, there's no negotiation on scope, there's nothing you can say about it, they're going to come in. Obviously, you need to read the warrant, but I've never seen a warrant that didn't have a full scope that could do whatever they wanted to. So, but be aware that there is the ability with OSHA to request a warrant that you don't have with other agencies. What's OSHA looking for when they come in the door? Well, generally they're looking for a violation of an OSHA standard. OSHA standards are really, really, really precise. So a good inspector will be looking for all the little tiny elements of each individual standard. And any deviation from any of the, those little elements can result in a citation. Close really isn't good enough for most inspectors. So, you know, any any small violation could be something that they're going to be kicking kicking, kicking off on their list. Uh, they're going to be looking at what type of violation it is, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But there are de minimis violations other than serious, serious, willful, repeat, or criminal. That's something that they're going to have to look at if they're going to be, um, you know, sending you a citation. We've got negligence here. Negligence isn't an element. So it's absolutely certain that, you know, if, if, if you, there is a violation, it won't matter whether you were negligent. It won't matter whether you knew about it. It won't matter. You'll still get a citation. However, negligence can make things worse. So you don't want to give the inspector any evidence of neg negligence because if uh, it looks like you knew about the standard and you just didn't get around to doing anything about it, then that leads to a more likely that they will cite a willful citation. Um, and it, it's one of the major reasons why you want to keep your comments to, the, to an inspector at a minimum during the inspection because things that you say can lead them to believe that you were negligent, which then leads to more serious, more serious violations. And then the, the inspector is also going to look at abatement because not only will the OSHA inspector cite you for violations of different standards, every standard that you violate it has to be fixed before the whole matter is closed out. So the, the inspector will be looking at how you can fix things. And essentially the inspector probably has really very little idea of what it would take to fix many of the violations that, you, that are found. So you want to keep your ears open to figure out what the inspector is thinking. So potentially you can have some ammunition later when it comes to closing conference and you might want to discuss abatement a little bit. So you might want to ask a question about, you know, what abatement might be appropriate. 
Now these are the types of violations that, um, that OSHA is looking for. Every violation that they cite you for, they have to figure out whether it's one of these types. So the first type is de minimis, which they say has no direct immediate relation to safety and health. The, there's never any penalty for a de minimis violation. Uh, quite often they, there's abatement, but um, essentially it's still a violation and it's listed. Um, and, you know, I find that there are very few things that they think of as de minimis. So you may find a de minimis violation, but even though something you think of as de minimis is usually going to be cited as either the other than serious or serious. An other than serious violation is a violation that relates to safety and health, but it's not serious. A serious violation means it could, there's a hazard that could cause an accident or an illness that's most likely to result in death or serious physical harm unless the employer did not know or could not have known of the violation. That's pretty, that's pretty specific, and that definition is really important to look at because later on, most violations you'll find are going to be cited by the OSHA inspector as serious, and you need to look at that specific definition if later you're going to argue with the agency that the, uh, the violation wasn't that serious. Um, usually you want the matter to be downgraded from serious because of the impact on matters outside of OSHA, and, but there are some, some standards, however, that OSHA will always cite as serious, and there's not going to be any way that you're going to get them to reduce it. A re repeat violation is the same or substantially similar violation within the last five years. So they're looking for history not only at the particular facility where they're, where they're at that particular time, but across any other sites owned by the same company or even subsidiaries. They can look across states. They can look across subsidiaries and look and see if this particular company has a pattern and practice of violations of a particular standard. Now, they don't look, um, some states, we didn't talk about this earlier, but some states have what they call a state plan. In other words, the state itself uh, handles OSHA. The uh, federal government does not handle OSHA. When you have that situation, federal OSHA will not look to state plan state violations. So you only be looking at those OSHA violations. But that's one of the reasons why you look at this later um, and you look at, um, you know, when you're looking at whether you're going to challenge a violation, uh, you know, if it's something that could easily be violated somewhere else, that's another reason why you might want to fight really hard if you've got um, a good argument here. But you don't want to build a history because if you've got, have a repeat somewhere else, your penalties could be five times higher. And if you've got more than one repeat, they could be ten times higher than they otherwise would be. So it's important to avoid repeats in any way possible. There, are, there is a possibility for a criminal violation if you have a willful violation that causes an employee death. Hopefully you don't have to face one of those. So your goals in, in the inspection itself is, first thing you want to do is you want to know what, what your industry's top cited standards are. And this is something you should do before you have an inspection. You should just know this. You should go, OSHA's website has a, data, a database page where you can put in your SIC code or NAICS code and you can figure out what other companies like yours are getting cited for. And every inspector who's going to go out and inspect you is going to look for you know, what, that, what the top cited standards are, and they're going to be looking in particular at your facility for those. So you should know that already, and you should be looking at those in advance so that you, know, so that you, you know, essentially fix that so that uh, when the inspector comes and looks, they'll realize right off the bat that you're, you know, you're better than average in the industry. Second is, when they show up, you want to be able to limit the scope and the guide the inspection the best you can. So first of all, you want to find out from the inspector what it is that they want to see and only go after that. Two, you need to be with the inspector at all times. Three, keep it friendly and professional. I mean, never argue. The inspector is doing his or her job, and they're not out to get you. 
and they'll perfect and that's just basically what they're supposed to be doing and they'll appreciate a professional relationship with them. Show the best side of your safe workplace. So if you have a, you know, a company-wide safety and health policy that you're following, it's a good idea to tell them that. If you have a strong safety culture, let the inspector know that. Uh, accompany OSHA everywhere they go. The OSHA inspector should never be left alone. A management, a management um, person should be with OSHA wherever that person is. Document, and again, some of these things will going kind to of be repeated, repeating later, but document everything that happens during the inspection. Document questions, document everything that happens. You err on the side, as it says here, avoid harmful emissions but provide helpful, helpful information. Frankly, err on the side of being quiet. Unless you know what you're doing, don't talk about violations because generally, what you say on a, without any chance to reflect and think about it likely will hurt you more than it helps. At, but find out what OSHA is thinking. Ask them questions. Ask them open-ended questions. Why do you think that? What do you think is the problem here? That kind of thing. That's all fine. Okay, next thing we're going to have here is a poll question. There are several state CLEs that require you to uh, us to provide you with a poll question. So the question we have here is, how does OSHA gain access to a, a work site? And please answer, you know, either they need a warrant or the employee's consent. They can enter in at any time um, if they like under the Occupational Safety and Health Act or if they believe a violation occurred, OSHA can enter without any consent. So please take a second to answer that. And then we're going to turn this back over to Avi. Okay, we've got a screen up here. Thank you, Amy. We've got a screen up here with um, some of the answers coming in. And it looks like uh, most people uh, got it right, which is that OSHA needs either a warrant or the employer's consent to get into a work site. We had a few questions come in while Amy was um, going through the last few slides, and I wanted to address uh, just a couple of them. Someone asked how long it typically takes uh, for OSHA to get a warrant, and um, it really can vary. It can be within a day or a few days, uh, or it can be longer than that. Um, it it has a lot to do with uh, what exactly is going on and what they're trying to affect. If they think that there's something serious going on inside, they will apply greater resources to get it done faster. Um, if it's something that's a, a long-term issue that uh, doesn't, uh, in their eyes, seriously concern workplace safety or health as much, uh, they might put it on a, on a slower burn. Um, someone also asked about repeat violations and uh, whether they go across a company that has multiple operations, affiliates, and work sites? Um, and the answer is typically yes. Uh, so a company that operates a chain of stores, for example, uh, if you get cited in one location, um, that's your history when, when OSHA visits other locations, and you can get repeats based on that. Um, likewise, uh, re uh, abatement issues can be uh, broad and Settlement agreements can also be corporate-wide sometimes. So uh, OSHA does take a broad view uh, when they're doing this enforcement. Um, we'll try to continue to get to the questions as we go. Um, but for, for now, I want to turn to just the overview of the process of the inspection uh, once OSHA arrives. And so here we've got um, just the steps of the inspection. From the time OSHA arrives and you have an opening conference uh, to set the groundwork, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then a usually a physical site inspection where people go around and, and look at things at your facility. OSHA may want to do interviews of employees. They may have documents that they want to request. Um, and after they've done that, if they've done that, they may come back. Uh, it might be another day. It might be some weeks later. And they'll say, we want to do some follow-up. We have some more places we want to look at. We have some more people we want to talk to. We have some more documents we want to review. Finally, when OSHA is all done, they will come back and you can have a closing conference to review uh, what happened during the inspection and what their conclusions were. 
At that time, OSHA may decide to issue you one or more citations, and then at the end of all of that, you have an opportunity to contest those, uh, or you may decide to accept them and you'll just pay, uh, pay the penalties and do the abatement that OSHA requires. So let's talk about what to do when they first arrive. And I think one of the big things that people have to remember is you can't wait till that moment to try to prepare. You have to prepare well in advance to make sure that all the people who will be a part of this process know what they're supposed to do, know their role, and how to react. Um, just like anything else in your business, uh, if you want people to react well in the heat of the moment, you have to train them, you have to prepare them, uh, and it never hurts, by the way, to rehearse. Uh, a lot of companies with, with strong safety and health programs will either internally or bring in an outside consultant to do a, an audit, a safety and health audit, which will basically be a mock OSHA inspection. That gives you an opportunity to test and do a dressed rehearsal of uh, everything that happens once an OSHA inspector would walk in the door. The other thing to bear in mind is you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. And from the moment that OSHA arrives, if they're coming there for a programmed inspection and they have no reason to believe that there's anything wrong, or if they're there in response to a complaint and they're concerned that there might be something very in particular that's wrong, um, how you present yourself from the moment they walk in the door can help uh, shade what happens from that point forward. So for one thing, you want to prepare the receptionist or whomever is that first touch point that the OSHA inspector is going to encounter when he or she enters the building. Um, make sure that that person sitting there knows who to call within the company to, to address the fact that you've got an OSHA inspector on site, a compliance officer. Um, it may be your safety and health director. It may be your plant manager. It probably should be a phone tree of at least two or three people in case you can't reach one or more of them. Once the, the OSHA inspector is there, you want to make sure that you're following your normal procedures for dealing with visitors. And that goes for the very early moments. It certainly goes for when you might be doing any walk-arounds within the facility. If you have people sign in, then that's what the inspector should do. If you take business cards, that's what you should do. Uh, it's always a good idea to get the, the inspector's business card for your files. You want to make sure that um, someone looks at the uh, compliance officer's credentials just to confirm that this person is who he says he is. Um, if you have site-specific training that you do, if there's a video people have to watch to know about potential hazards, to know about PPE, uh, personal protective equipment they might have to wear while they're walking around, you want to make sure that you put the OSHA inspector through all of those normal procedures because if you fail to do that, and that's something that you're supposed to be doing, then you've just, you've just exposed them to uh, your workplace as being someplace that's not really following through with its stated procedures or potentially a place that's not following through with regulations, um, and you've harmed your first impression and you've also potentially exposed yourself to uh, your first violation. When you're organizing the opening conference, you want to make sure you're in the right place with the right people. So you want to try to meet in an office or a conference room. Going back to something that Amy said earlier with the plain view doctrine, the OSHA inspector can issue citations for anything that they can see from a place that they're allowed to be. So if you've granted consent to them to be in your office, then they can issue citations for whatever they see in the office. Um, but there's no value in taking them out to the floor of your factory um, or your warehouse uh, or your facility until you know what they're there for and what they want to accomplish and you've had a conversation with them about what the scope will be. And so doing it anywhere but the office or the conference room is just asking for them to start an inspection before you've even had a chance to do your opening conference. So do it someplace quiet, someplace away from the operations. Uh, you want to, of course, establish a cooperative attitude and, a, and relationship. I can't remember a single time where we advised the clients to do anything else. Um, it may not be that you're going to do everything that OSHA wants you to do, but that doesn't change the fact that you are doing everything in a cooperative spirit and in a positive way. Remember that the compliance officer is there to do a job. In their mind, they're there to protect the worker's safety and health. They're there to make sure that people are following the rules. And so you want to 
keep that in the back of your mind the entire time you're working with them. You want to respect that they're there for the right reasons, um, and you want to try to work with them while protecting your interests as well. It's important from the beginning to establish a single point of contact. When this inspection is taking place, the compliance officer is going to have lots of requests. They want to talk to people, they want to look at things, they want to get documents, and you want to make sure that those requests are being channeled in an organized fashion, that you're keeping track of every request that's coming in and making sure that you're responding. You want to make sure that you have some control over that line of communications so that there's someone you trust who's being the official spokesperson for the company with respect to the inspection. So establish a single point of contact and tell the inspector, you know, this is Joe. Joe's going to be your single point of contact. Or this is Emily. She's going to be the one to walk around with you. She's the one you should pose any questions to, ask for anything from. Finally, something that Amy said earlier, and we're going to say several times more, which is you should document everything. And it starts as soon as the inspection begins, as soon as the opening conference begins. Everything that OSHA says, you want to write it down. The things that you say in response, you want to write it down. You want to keep track of the times of things. You want to keep track of who was in the room. You want to keep track of uh, where you go and what you see. All of that is going to be critical for you as you later are working with OSHA if they have any concerns. And if, uh, unfortunately, you end up with a citation, you're going to need all that material in order to build your defense in the strongest way. There are a couple, things, a couple goals to think about when you're doing an opening conference. I'd say the first one is to learn everything you can, and the second one is to try to negotiate. So what you're trying to learn is everything you can about why OSHA is there. Why did they come? What do they want to do? What do they want to look at? Do they want to talk to somebody? If they want to talk to someone, who? Um, do they have a warrant? Or are they asking for you to let them in by consent? Uh, do they want to collect evidence? If you had, um, God forbid, a, a serious accident of some kind with some equipment that exploded, they might want to start taking stuff apart and hauling it away for evidence. Um, or they might want to work out an agreement to do that. Uh, if they're there for a health inspection, they might want to be taking health samples. You want to know exactly what their intentions are and what they want to do. Um, they may want certain documents. They want, want to take measurements of some kind. You want to ask as many questions as you can to get the full sense of what they want to accomplish. The second thing is the negotiation. So if they're there by your consent, then you're opening your door to them, and you should have an a conversation with them, a cooperative conversation with them about making sure that they can see what they want to see as quickly as possible so they can do their job quickly and your factory or facility can get back to what it uh, needs to do every day, which is your business. So um, you're trying to minimize the exposure of the inspector to the facility. Um, you're trying to facilitate what the inspector wants to get uh, to help them as quickly as possible. So that includes um, all these different pieces, are you going to walk around, what are you going to see? If, there's just a, if they have a complaint that a particular piece of equipment is missing a guard, then you should focus on getting them to see that piece of equipment without turning it into a full wall-to-wall -wall inspection of the entire facility. If they want to talk to 10 people, you should talk with them about, well, why do you want to talk to these people? Um, and if it turns out that there's something that really just a couple people might have the real answers to, maybe those people are people to start with, and they never need to talk to the other eight people. Um, that goes for documents as well. Sometimes the compliance officer may ask for an extended piece of uh, documentation, and you can negotiate uh, what the scope is, how many years back, what kinds of materials, and so forth. Up front in this opening conference is a good opportunity for you to let them know if you have concerns that you've got trade secrets or confidentiality issues where the inspector walking around may be seeing things that are secret or taking pictures of things that are secret. You want to make sure that you get that on the record because there are certain procedures that they need to follow in order to protect your uh, business and trade secrets. And then the last thing at the opening conference is, is make sure you've got the right people there, not only for the conference but also for the inspection. If you find out that they're interested in a certain mechanical issue, then you want, want to make sure that at a minimum you have one of your best in-house mechanics to go around 
if nothing else, just to observe and to be able to tell you what the mechanic is seeing and understanding and so forth, if not also to inform how you, how you communicate with OSHA. I'm going to turn it over to Amy, who's going to talk a little bit more about how to walk around with OSHA in the most effective way. Thanks, Avi. We're, we're getting some really good questions from folks, but I think we're also running low on time. So I think what we're going to do is we'll just answer these questions offline and uh, send them send them around to folks so we, we get make sure that they all get answered. But we're kind of running low on time. So I'd like all of us to, to get all of the information if we can. So you can actually, once you, you've got the prelim, preliminaries done, OSHA will always do a plant walk around. But you can actually plan the route. You know, most facilities have uh, a way to get around the facility in which you always go around the most probab problematic area. You know, if you can avoid that by going around the facility in a circuitous route, that's perfectly fine. Um, Pre-planning your path to minimize the exposure to other areas of the facility is, is perfectly fine. Um, you know, OSHA really just doesn't object to that. In fact, I've had a situation where OSHA came to a facility, all they wanted to do is figure out whether a particular forklift was in, had the correct, you know, met all the forklift standards. Uh, they took uh, the forklift outside, took the inspector outside and had him look at the forklift and then the inspector walked away. I don't know that all inspectors would be that willing to handle that, but essentially they, they you know, pre-planning your walk, your path around the facility is always a good idea. Management will accompany the inspector everywhere. Uh, go where, everywhere they go, carry the tools that they carry. Now everywhere they go, not only should you have a management employee there, you should have a note taker. The note taker, there should be somebody who's taking, as you know, we keep saying this over and over again, it's not to be a broken record, but it's because it's kind of important and people forget about it. And that is, you know, obviously it's document everything that, that they ask and everything that they do. Well, it's pretty hard for the management employee who's walking around and trying to pay attention to do that. So it's always a good idea to have a note taker. Uh, if the inspector is going to be taking pictures, it's always a good idea to have your own camera and duplicate those pictures. If they're measuring things, you measure them as well. Um, don't perform demonstrations if they want you to wake up a machine and have it run. I, you know, essentially, you can just say it's not working. It's not set up to work right now because you know that if it's not set up to work, it probably won't work the way it's supposed to. Uh, again, photograph photograph everything that they they uh, are. They're taking pictures of, but make sure that you're not taking pictures, you know, of of things in the background that would be a problem. So you you just want to make it make sure that your photographs are limited to what OSHA is looking at, and note any comments by OSHA, the employees, and management, and describe all the conditions that they've got. If, you, if the inspector finds a condition, and by the way, the inspector almost always finds a condition. There's almost always something out there. So you know, it's too late to worry about it. So don't get, you know, don't get upset about the fact that they found a citation, something that they're going to send you a citation about. You know, it, it's, it, you know, if it happens, it happens, and you, know, you can deal with that later. But the very first thing you need to do is to fix it. If you can fix a hazard while the, the inspector is in, the, in your facility, it's the best thing you can possibly do. Because number one, you won't have to abate it later or prove that you've abated it later. And two, sometimes that minimizes the penalty. Most often if you fix it, they're still going to cite you for it. But you're gonna, you may, it may affect the penalty and it definitely will affect the abatement that you have to do. You can certainly ask, why do you think this is a violation? Which standard? So you can get right away, you can figure out what the problem is. Um, you can ask them whether they're going to issue a citation, what type. Again, open-ended questions. Um, understand whatever abatement. Kind of ask them, what do you think we can do for abatement here? And if that's going to be a challenge or if that's going to make things less safe, you can talk about it then. You can also talk about that in the closing conference. Um, if, if that's if whatever abatement they're talking about is going to take a lot of time, you say, hey, well, that's going to take us a lot of time. That's a lot more, uh, a lot more involved than you think about. Because quite often, 
what the inspector thinks of as adequate abatement may not have anything to do with, with what works in your facility. Uh, never ever lie or exaggerate incorrectly. I, I got a few examples of admissions that you don't want to make. Um, essentially avoid admissions and the kinds of things that we find people saying in inspections are, you know, people take this personally, so when an inspector finds something, you feel, you know, you feel bad about it. Uh, you know, I'll give an example of an admission. You, you, you say something like, I, I meant to get around to that, but I've been so busy, I just haven't been able to do that. Or you say, we've listed this in our capital projections, but we just, we haven't been able, I can't get my boss to give me the funding. Um, you know, or I'm really glad you said that because I've been trying to get management's attention to get this fixed. Well, you know, when you say those things, what you've done is you created the situation where they can they can cite a willful citation. In other words, they can say you knew about it and you failed or just did not um, did not uh, uh, fix it. So that self-serving admissions. When I say self-serving, self-serving to you, but not the company. Don't do any good at all. So please avoid that at all costs. So again, that gets back to what do and don't we talk about. What you do talk about, you want to talk about what OSHA's emissions are, their policy, what kind of training and resources OSHA has available. You want to let them know you have a great safety record, uh, any awards or achievements you have. You want to, you really want to project a cooperative attitude. What you don't want to talk about, again, are those harmful emissions, um, unprofessional arguments. Basically, safety is this person's job. You know, the, the, the inspector considers himself a safety professional and that they're important. They, they think they're an important part of maintaining a safe workplace at your office. Um, so treat them like a professional. Uh, if you're somebody that's uncomfortable around silence, you know, basically that means a lot of time you just keep your mouth shut. Um, if you're somebody that's uncomfortable around silence, first of all, you might want to find somebody that's comfortable with silence. But second of all, talk about the weather, not heat really because that can be a problem, but talk about the weather or sports teams. There's something very neutral uh, that has nothing to do with the workplace. Next we have another poll question. Uh, essentially what says, when an OSHA compliance officer takes fo photographs at the work site, what should you do? If you would please answer those questions, and I'm going to turn this over to Avi, and we'll move forward. Thanks, Amy. I'm just going to advance it to the poll results page. We'll see what's come in so far. Yep, it looks like uh, everybody got the right answer who's answered it so far. You want to Try to take photos of your own to document the conditions that you see. One, one other comment on the photographs. I had a client once that had uh, uh, an issue about whether their workplace was too dusty. And there was a little bit of dust, but it wasn't anything serious. The inspector took a photograph with a flash on the camera, and the flash reflected off some of the dust particles, and it made it look like it was a historic blizzard inside that workplace. The, the company took a similar photograph standing from the same place but without the flash. And what you could see from the company's photograph was that it was a clear workplace. You could see from one end to the other. There was no problem with visibility. There was no problem with uh, dust that was you know, going to prevent people from breathing correctly and so forth. So think about the, the photographs you're taking and, and try to make sure that they're going to be helpful to you and, and certainly not harmful to you. Okay, um, we'll talk just a minute about documents and interviews. So OSHA will often ask if they can see documents. There are two types of documents for this purpose. One is the kind of document or record that OSHA requires you to keep under the law and regulations, like a 300 log. Um, and that's something that they can always see, and you should always facilitate them seeing. Now, sometimes they may, you might say to them, uh, would you like us to make you a copy of that? Um, and so you can do that rather than actually have them look through it. If they're looking through documents, even the ones that, are there, uh, that you're required to keep, you want to keep track of what they looked at. Um, make a set of copies for yourself for your inspection file so that when you go back later to see what did the OSHA inspector look at, you'll have a copy for yourself. The second type of records are things you're not, you're not required to keep by regulation. These are things you might keep for your own business purposes, uh, human resources documents, 
internal policies, safety procedures, um, job safety analysis uh, and task lists and things like that. And those are things where you want to tell OSHA, look, we have a company policy that we, we would like to request all document requests in writing. And that way you keep track of exactly what they've asked for so that you know that you're giving them what they asked for. It also helps you analyze it. It gives you something to look at with your counsel, with your um, senior folks to make sure that you're giving them stuff that you should be giving them. For those kinds of non-required records, there's no reason why you should give them anything on the spot. You should take the time to go see what's there, um, see what the scope is, and then you can come back and try to explain, hey, you know, uh, you asked for five years of stuff. That's going to take an awfully long time to pull together. How about we get you the last 12 months? Uh, or you asked us for the, the employee files of 10 people. Um, what about just the one person or the two people involved in the accident? Um, again, if they're not sending you uh, court orders for documents, you're doing this voluntarily, at least at this stage. So it's an opportunity for you to streamline the investigation and the benefit for them is they get what they want more focused and more quickly. The benefit for you is sometimes there might be stuff that's three years back that you'd rather not turn over. Um, and so if you can focus the, the energies on the, the present issues, that can help you out a lot. Likewise, they might ask you if they can interview people. And the important thing to remember is, again, as long as these are voluntary, the, the choice about interviews is up to each person that's been asked. So it's the witness who gets to decide if they want to do an interview. And because it's voluntary, well, they get to set the parameters, right? Because they can always say, you know what, I, ha I changed my mind. I don't really want to do this. So that means that the witness gets to decide how long they're going to sit for an interview, where they're going to do it, when they want to take a break, if someone else is in the room, who's in the room. We always recommend that you have at least one person in the room with the witness. It's great if it's a management person or even your lawyer, so that there's someone who can take notes and really look out for the, for the best interests of the witness and the, and the company. But even if not, if the witness wants the union uh, boss, maybe there's someone who's a productive uh, person there, or just a friend. It's good to have someone in the room to make sure that each person who's asking and answering questions, that they're understanding each other, that the conversation is clear. Um, someone to keep an eye on the watch and say, you know, we've been going for half an hour. Why don't we take a break so that the witness can get some fresh air and some water. Um, someone to take notes so that we know what actually happened in there. Uh, it's really, really beneficial to have someone in the room. Um, you want to try to prepare the witnesses in advance, and this will depend on if it's a management person or, or a, a, an hourly employee. But, but either way, it's helpful to have a conversation with them to make sure that they understand their rights and that you explain to them how you're prepared to be helpful to them. Help them understand uh, what, what you think the government's looking at and, and focusing on and so forth so that they're not surprised and, and thrown for a loop when they get in there. If it's a supervisor, then the company has a right to have someone in the room. And so you want to make sure that you have management in that room every time. Ideally, uh, if it's anything remotely serious, you'll have a lawyer in there. Um, not to interfere. It's important that the person who's sitting in the room knows their role and that they're really trying to let the conversation happen as much as possible, but to interject and to clarify when necessary. After all of that takes place, all of these steps of the inspection, there's an opportunity for a closing conference. The most important thing is do have the closing conference. This is another chance for you to learn what OSHA is thinking. It's an opportunity for you to discuss before anything is written in stone what they want you to do to abate, whether there was a violation, how serious it was, this is a chance for you to respectfully explain your position. You, can, you may have had a fair amount of time since the whole thing started at this point. You might have some information to share with them that's helpful that you've talked with your counsel about um, that would be good to provide. Um, you want to request copies of samples and photographs and evidence and things like that so that your inspection file is as complete as possible as you move into the next stage. Amy, you want to talk about what happens after you've been cited? Sure. Well, we're going to hope that you don't get, a, get cited, but uh, as I said earlier, it, it happens. Uh, these, these standards are pretty precise, so you can get a citation. Uh, if you get a citation, that citation is not final. 
It can be contested. You have 15 working days to contest that conference, that uh, citation. And during those 15 working days, and it's working, not calendar, so that's about three weeks, you have the ability to have what they call an informal conference with the area director or the assistant area director where you can go to OSHA, actually to their offices, or you can have it on, as a conference call and essentially make your case to them. You can, you can explain uh, that some of the, not all of those citations that they do are correct. They don't always have the information correct. Quite often they see something they don't like and they'll pick a citation that they say applies to it, but that's not right. So quite often they'll pick the wrong citation. So in the informal conference, you have an ability to go talk to them and say, hey, no, I don't think this is appropriate. This citation doesn't fit. Uh, it's not at all unusual for citations to be dropped or the severity to be reduced or the penalties reduced during the informal conference. You can also negotiate abatement dates very easily. There's very, very little downside to having an informal conference. However, you have to have it within that 15 working days. If you don't, then the citation is final unless you contest it. So the question is, should you contest? Because once those 15 days are over, if you haven't contested it, you have to pay the, the citation and you have to abate in the time period that they give you in the citation. So if you contest it, some of the things you look at are, are the penalties expensive uh, or is the abatement costly? So there are things, as Avi said very early on, there are things other than penalties that really affect you. And quite often these citations don't cost a whole lot when it comes to penalties. But there's a lot of other costs available, like the abatement itself might cost a whole lot more than the penalty. The fact that you have a citation on the, on the record that could affect other sites and who could have a repeat would be a reason to contest. You know, especially if you don't really have a violation, whether you think you really have a good case to challenge their, their finding of a violation. Uh, you could also have a defense, like empl uh, unpreventable employee misconduct, which is hard to prove, but if you have that kind of defense, you can bring it up in a contest. Uh, if it's a repeat, like I said earlier, that would, you know, give you a, you may want to avoid another repeat. Uh, if you have an accident, the fact that you had a, an OSHA citation can cause, uh, you know, essentially can cause a negligence finding in a civil lawsuit, so you may want to settle this in some way in which it can't be used in a, in a, a civil lawsuit. And some citations affect government contracts or other contract community, employee or other investor relations. So there's, there's often a lot of reasons why you might want to contest, and a lot of these contests result in a settlement where you can structure uh, what you eventually are going to have to pay for and be responsible for. Should you use legal counsel in this process? Uh, within 24 hours, usually, a you know, we can help you triage and answer, should you just pay the penalty and move on? In other words, if it's easy, fix, the penalty is low, and you've got a clear violation, perhaps maybe that's something you should do. Uh, what do you risk? if you accept the citation? How much can I expect to accomplish in an informal conference? And like I said, quite often you can accomplish quite a bit in an informal conference. We can also help you. We can, uh, we can represent you at the informal conference or we can put together bullet point lists of talking points that you can have at the informal conference that will help you uh, change and settle the violation differently than as it was originally listed in the citation. So we can give you an idea whether OSHA will withdraw some of the citations, whether you have a case to withdraw some of them, and how low OSHA will likely go on the penalty. Uh, we'll, we can give you, uh, you know, some ideas of the chances of success in litigation. Okay, we have one last poll question, and then Avi will be wrapping things up for us. Thanks very much. So this question is, how many days does an employer have in which to contest an OSHA citation after receiving it? Want to go forward and work on that answer, and I'll turn this over to Avi. Thank you, Amy. So let's see how many people got it right. 78% so far. About 15 working days is the number. So um, thank you for joining us. Just a few closing thoughts. Um, first of all, 
want to direct your attention again to our uh, free blog, Safety Law Matters, where we're providing updates and strategy tips, uh, information like in this webinar. Um, and you can just follow the link uh, on this screen or it's in your resource list to subscribe and it will notify you when we post new material there. In addition, we want to call your attention to the fact that, uh, again, there are several other uh, sessions of this webinar series. Um, the next one is going to be August 16th, talking about OSHA's shifting ground, what to expect from OSHA in the Trump administration. And we are going to take the questions that you all sent us while we've been on the line here and uh, get back to you with answers. We'll try to put together uh, some answers that we can share more widely uh, so that everybody can benefit. We've got a team of, as we said, more than 20 people around the country, and we're all available to answer your questions. We'd love to try to help people with, with some advice on the front end so that uh, people have less pain on the back end. Uh, try to avoid problems and, and get everything into compliance, train up their teams, and so forth. You can find our contact information here. So once again, thank you for joining us. We hope the information was helpful. If you haven't done so already, please click on the survey icon at the bottom of your screen to complete our short survey. Your feedback will really help us make sure that we're providing quality programs in the future. As a reminder, uh, this program was approved by Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Tennessee, Texas, and Wisconsin for continuing legal education credit, and Kansas is still pending. It's also been approved for one hour of HRCI and SHRM for HR folks. The recording of the webcast will be available tomorrow for watching and sharing. Once available, the link will be emailed to you along with their certificate of attendance. We hope you'll join us for the next webinar and the rest in the series. This concludes our webinar. Um, you have all our contact information. We'd love to, uh, to speak with you to try to answer your questions and to try to be helpful, so please don't hesitate to be in touch. Thanks very much for joining us. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.